Uh, yeah, so I guess Flying Fish Technologies wanted to uh, first acknowledge the reason that, that we're here and, and say thanks. It probably was about five or six weeks ago that John got in touch and sort of said what might be possible. Uh, we were pretty busy at the time, but the uh, gap, gap popped up. So we just thought, let's, let's make this happen. Um, we absolutely want to acknowledge that the, the effects of the wildfire are still very, very raw uh, and that they've touched a lot of people in this, in this area, but also uh, you know, more globally as well. So for people watching, people here, um, our condolences. You guys are going through a rough... It's not just being here, but to really getting the job done and, and well and, and for us being comfortable despite crazy long days and that sort of stuff. Uh, so first and foremost, Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, um, Amy, Amy and John went out of their way to, to pull all this together, had some great conversations around exactly what was needed. So we rocked up and, and we knew this is the job. Um, Maui Ocean Centre for connecting us with some local resources and providing this fantastic venue and opportunity to share some of what we've learned, what we've experienced with, with the community. Uh, Brandon from Maui Boating, um, those hire boats, uh, it's probably not what they were designed for, but they do make excellent research vessels. And uh, he was always a phone call away, no matter where we were, uh, we seemed to be able to get a hold of him. So that was fantastic. Um, the lovely staff at Ali'i Resorts uh, and Nathan and Cindy Kellogg uh, for our wonderful accommodation. Um, we've stayed in a, a lot of places all over the world and some of them are nice and some of them you just got to get through. So it was really nice to have a, a comfortable bed to, to come back at the end of a, end of a uh, trip. Uh, Supana and Manish for the use of their electric vehicle. Uh, it was a tiny little car we were told in advance and it wasn't wrong. Uh, but you know, most underwater vehicles wouldn't even fit in it, but we managed to get three of them and ourselves in there comfortably. So that was fantastic. Uh, Maui Coast Guard, super professional and, um, you know, great to be out on the water. We had a couple of interactions with them, just giving us a heads up on where we should and shouldn't be, that sort of stuff. Um, DAR, TNC and Scripps for helping to refine our survey targets. So we, we knew what sort of work had been done before, where we should try and get as much overlap as possible in our, in our survey areas. Um, and just a big thank you to the Maui community. Uh, our whole experience has just been warm, welcome. It's been fantastic to be here. We would have loved to have spent a little bit more time on the beach, uh, but that'll be for another trip. Um, Flying Fish Technologies, we're, we're a brand new tech startup um, we specialize in wide area visual underwater surveys. So we collect visual data under the water very, very fast over very large areas. Um, we also do a lot of analysis. Uh, we've, we've got teams of ecologists, marine biologists, etc. Uh, we, we do use AI for analysis. We do uh, all kinds of reporting that will come out of this over time. Um, the core team, the team that's here, especially myself, CEO, I do a lot of the AI work as well as some of the 3D modeling. Uh, and I also pilot, pilot the gliders as well. Um, Dr. Brett Kettle, you probably see the resemblance later, he's my father. Uh, he's a multi-skilled marine scientist uh, and he developed this incredible new technology about five years ago. Uh, we've been sort of refining it, working on it and uh, really started to apply it commercially in the last year or so. Um, Josh Riddell, he's our mechatronics guru and uh, Top Gun glider pilot. Um, he's spent the uh, last few years with us refining Brett's invention and uh, helping us to go a lot further, a lot faster. In a moment, I'll hand over to Brett and he'll take you through a presentation that goes into a little bit more detail on who we are and the technology and you'll see all kinds of amazing imagery. Uh, but I'd just like to ask you guys to keep a few things in mind as we, as we go through this presentation. Our team only landed in Maui six days ago. Um, we've, we, six and a half days ago, we've been on the water for six days or less than six days. We haven't had time really to do a detailed analysis of any of the data that we found. It's been evenings after we get off the water, early morning work. Um, every single one of the images that you see in this presentation has uh, detailed metadata associated with it. We collect 15 frames a second, go long distances, but every single one of those images has a lot of additional data behind it, including very, very precise location data and some environmental data. Um, so just think as we 
see this presentation, how big that data set is and, and the value of that for the community and, 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 and more broadly. Um, every image that we have is now securely recorded and it's a permanent timestamp record of what's there. Um, it's, it's an opportunity for us to ask some questions today, but it's an opportunity for us to reflect a year from now, three years from now, and have a look back and see how things have evolved and changed over time. Um, that's all from me. I'm going to hand over to Brett now. Thank you all. When we survey the marine environment at large scale, we tend to use sonars, uh, multi-beam, uh, you know, side scans, etc., and we image the bottom by listening to the echoes. And uh, about you, all you can tell from that is hardness and, and, uh, and distance. Uh, on the other hand, scientists who want to learn about the ecology dive into the water and they, and they get up close and personal and they are looking in detail at identify, identifying species and relationships and things like that. Our tech allows that same millimetre view that you get on the left in the bottom there, that's literally one of the corals we saw uh, um, you know, a couple of days ago. Uh, and we can scan seabeds at scales of up to 100 kilometres a day so that every piece of that 100 kilometres, if you zoom into it in the system, you can see it down to the millimetre level. So it's for the first time ever, it's enabling um, area coverage of the type that people get from uh, side beam, multi-beam uh, multi and side scan and stuff like that but using visual, visual data. Hey, look, thanks for having us here. I, I wanna, I'll just add my, um, pay my respects to, to everybody who's been going through a tough time here uh, in Maui. Firstly, the people up at uh, Lahaina, uh, but also the rest of the community. Uh, there are ripple impacts through the community as well. So just wanna acknowledge, Sometimes it might sound like we come in and we do these cool jobs and show some new tech and we have a lot of fun, but the reality is particularly driving uh, the boat up and through the area, it's hugely impactful to realise just what's been going on. Um, so there are lots of ways that things move through the air, um, starting from the top and working clockwise. Sometimes we use balloons or blimps, etc., and these basically work by buoyancy, and that in the marine environment would be called a glider. We fire things, including rockets and projectiles, and they travel like a rocket and projectile, and that's equivalent to the uh, IVAs and the, these sort of torpedo shape, in fact, torpedo-derived designs. We sometimes play in the local park and fly things like kites, and that's what these sleds down the, the um, next one down there are, and helicopters just use brute force of rotors to move themselves around the sky, and that's what ROVs do. Nobody yet flies, like an aeroplane, flies underwater, and that's what we do. Um, so uh, a lot of design principles around acrobatic, fast acrobatic agile flight. I, I don't want to drag on too long on this, so you guys want to start seeing the imagery, I know. But to all intents and purposes, we tow our machine behind a boat for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, a lot of people go, oh, why aren't you fully autonomous? I go, because we couldn't do what we do if we were fully autonomous. Many different ways that we can use our machine. Everybody in the world who tows something behind a boat does it a bit like this. It's directly towed behind the vessel. In our case, we have a special ability where our machine can fly off to one side of the track of the vessel to the point where we can run multiple machines behind one vessel and, and uh, our system spec at the moment is around about six machines flying behind a vessel simultaneously. They can fly their own paths in, in semi-parallel, perhaps dodging around a, a piece of coral, or they can fly in coordination. We can also have the boat travel outside of a 
uh, an indented reef edge and allow the machine to go in and survey the edge, for example, in under the surf uh, and have the boat stand off of the surf. Round and round coral heads, uh, you know, crisscross, everybody can do that. But if we uh, have multiple machines, we can infill very quickly. Everybody points their camera at the seabed. But our machine is pretty unique in that we can also fly our aeroplane like an acrobatic aeroplane on its side to image back against steep vertical cliffs, such as the seaward side of Molokini, where we were this morning. Man, that was very cool, very nerve wracking. So here's the, <laughs> here's the machine uh, in uh, our home bay. It's been given a single command and that is go to the seabed, stay a metre above the seabed and image the seagrasses. After that point, the pilot's not even touching the controls. And it'll go hours and hours and hours like that. It manages itself to do that. Our cameras point down and forwards and they're a wide angle camera. And there's two reasons for that. I want to try and quickly skip over this. I said to um, Brandon a few minutes ago, and hey, Brandon, thank you very much for allowing me to use your boat outside of its typical operating envelope. <laughs> um, he made a couple of allowances and I'm very, very glad he did. Thank you. Um, if we wanted to do facial recognition on you guys in the audience here, but we put our camera in the roof pointing down, you'll find a bald spot here. <laughs> you'll find some heads of hair and you can't quite pick the difference whether it's a male or a female. But if you want to actually see the features of a face and do recognition, you'd have to bring your camera down here. That's where we put our camera. We put our camera down amongst the corals. We don't fly up on the surface and look down on the fish from above. We fly amongst them and identify them that way. We take lots and lots of images. We take uh, uh, 14 images per second. So around about every 70 milliseconds, we're taking a new image. And we can analyze that entire image for different things. We analyze out there for shapes and morphologies that are of interest, such as fish and stuff like that. We analyze down there at the base of the image for the kinds of things that scientists like to do as a percentage cover, such as percentage coral cover. So in this particular case, you can see the image number on the, on the right hand side, and you can see a graph of the live, percentage live coral cover made, a new estimate made every 70 milliseconds, so that it's a, at our speeds, that's approximately 18 centimetres. So every 18 centimetres forward, we're going X percent coral cover, X percent coral cover x percent coral cover and we can aggregate that up over vast distances we haven't yet done it for you guys but uh, we could uh, quite comfortably aggregate that over 50 kilometers of the transects that we've been doing so it's a very fast method if you had to use traditional diver based marine monitoring methods um, for a day of hours you'd have to put 480 divers in the water if you wanted to cover the same area as we cover in a day you'd have to put three and a half thousand divers into the water. If you wanted to make as many estimates of coral cover and things like that as we do, and, and given that the divers don't actually do that in the water, they post-process that later on, the live coral inferences done by Manitou, we're about seven and a half thousand times that. That's if we're running one glider. If we're running three gliders behind the boat, times all that by three. Here's an example of what you see when you're operating our system uh, in the field. And I'll talk you through it again in a second and we'll scrub back through it. Now, first thing I'm gonna say is, that image up on the top left looks a little wacky. It's tilted over. You'll have to put your head on one side, I'm afraid. You can see the, the surface of the water up here. The reason it's tilted over is because that was a very steep cliff and we flew the machine on its side to image back into the cliff. The green box here is where we count fish. The red box here is what is we, we pull these slivers up here and we stitch them together and that becomes a top down view. And this is where we work out percentage live coral cover and things like that. Uh, in these graphs, you'll see the red in this particular case is for the scissor tail um, uh, and the 
green is a cesia. It's a species that's uh, certainly in the Great Barrier Reef and, uh, and Red Sea. Uh, this is a slightly different urchin to the one, the common black urchin that you have. It's a longer spine one, it's a diadema. And we run a live coral metric as well. We also graph things here. I'm just gonna quickly um, zip through and show you a couple of things here. Um, you probably notice some incredible variation in the amount of live coral cover that the machine picks up as it's flying along. And so we ask ourselves the question, now I'll, I'll point out that this end of the graph here, that's the zero point, that's what's underneath the machine as it's flying. So let's just advance that video to the point where we've got a spot with high coral cover right underneath the machine. There we go. So there's the high spot of coral cover right here on the top of this ridge of coral. Beautiful coral on the top of the ridge. So what happened next? Um, as, we, as we scroll back, here we go. The worst of the coral cover is about there and that, is, that matches the gully between two heads of coral. So you can see where we are able to discern changes in coral cover over minute distances and they have an ecological meaning. Where were all the fish? Well, let's look, for example, the, the fish which are the green dots um, and we'll find the high point of those. I think it was actually about there. And there they are. They've swum out of the deeper water coming up onto the reef. There's a patch of them there. Where were the, uh, the red dot fish? That's the uh, scissor tails, Abedeftaf. They were there. You can see them all up closer here. Um, again, spatial differences between the way these critters spread themselves on a reef that we're able to detect in an instant. Um, we also convert some of this stuff into 3D. Here's a section of a vertical wall that was captured as a single pass in 19 seconds. It didn't take, it was a little bit longer to process it, but even so it was only a, a, an hour or so, 40 minutes. Um, most of the people doing this kind of work, including a lot of the sites around the island here, use um, markers, divers have to go down, place markers, place GPS positions, tape, tape measures, pins in the ground, all this kind of thing. And that means it's not a terribly scalable solution. Our solution doesn't use divers to place any of this material. Our, our machine collects enough information that it can work all that out by itself. But look at what you get. Absolutely beautiful views of how that coral structured an overhang here, look at that, this overhanging. Uh, a bit, a few holes here where there was some dirty water running off the top of the reef, just obscured it a little bit too much. But what a beautiful way to imagine the reef. Uh, and I know Brandon has spoken to us about maybe uh, friends of Molokini might be interested in looking at some of our 3D stuff that we did out there. And, and, and I think I've actually got a little bit of that to show you in a minute. Um, but the cool thing is this surface is a three-dimensional surface that you can play with in a model and in a CAD program and things like that. It's in that 19 seconds, 48 million polygons that describe that surface. Um, average polygon size of about two millimeters. So we capture the texture of things with an average accuracy of around about two millimeters. So we were on the plane, uh, here you go. Funny thing about timeline, datelines. We left on a Friday afternoon, we arrived on a Friday morning, thank you. On the way home, <laughs> we lose a day. But um, that's all of our personal gear, a bit of a toolbox on the right hand side as well, and three of our machines, each one of them in one of those um, Pelican cases on the ground. So this is a machine that's intended to be tiny and able to be used out of a small boat. We don't need a winch. We don't need a 110 volt power supply. We don't need safety boots. Thank goodness. Or hard hats. So we had some fun over the last few days. And essentially we launched it off the back of the boat. Uh, that's uh, 
Josh doing all of the techo stuff and making sure it, it works and flies and piloting it. He, he really is our, uh, our stunt pilot, um, our top gun pilot. And, um, uh, you know, assemble it in the boat over the side away it goes. We saw some really cool things. We always see turtles, but I tell you what, I'm, I, I wouldn't have believed it except someone said Maui turtles are laid back. Man, they are, <laughs> they are so chill. It's incredible. I couldn't believe it. So some key statistics. Um, I think we racked up 300 odd miles in, uh, in Brandon's boat. Uh, we have 150 kilometres of continuous vision transects uh, and that stretches from uh, down at uh, Cindercone across to uh, Black Rock, uh, Kanapali. 18.7 um, hours of scanning, 75 hectares of seabed scanned. Now let me put that into context. The biggest seabed scanning project in the world happens at the top end of the Red Sea. They're looking to scan one kilometre of uh, one square kilometre, which is 100 hectares. They've been going a couple of years so far, many, many challenges. And in just uh, six days, we've managed to do 75 hectares. So it's an incredibly fast technology. Eight, 800,000 seabed photos. Now, put that into a context. The two biggest repositories of coral reef seabed photos in the world. One belongs to UCSD, uh, and that's called CoralNet, and the Australian Institute of Marine Science, that's uh, reefcloud.ai. Each of those has around about 3 million images collected over years and years. We've collected a quarter of either of those two collections in just six days. So it's an incredible data capture rate. You guys have now have a resource describing these reefs, which is pretty much unheard of anywhere in the world. Molokini, I love it. Man, but you've got to be there early to be able to drive your, your robot along the edge without running into someone. We were there this morning, and, um, and Brandon, just close your eyes for a minute. Uh, at one stage, I think the GPS told me that I was traveling on the land, but um, <laughs> no, I wasn't, I promise, Brendan. This is not video from the glider. This is a 3D um, recreation of what a number of passes of the glider saw as it went up over some of the shallower banks of, of that area. I'm going to pause it here in a second. I want to show you something. There you go. There's my pause signal right there. I want to pause it here for a second. A little later on in the presentation, I'm going to show you some images around Lahaina that have a lot of grey stuff on the seabed. And if I didn't pause this here or somewhere else and show you, it would be very easy to look at those images and gain a wrong impression that everything grey on the seabed around Lahaina is ash or some fire product or whatever. The point of this is that a lot of the, the uh, lava uh, that's, that's in the ocean here, that's forming a lot of your structures, is eroding over time and it produces these very, very dark surfaces. I've not personally experienced that before. And so when I first looked at some of that photography from Lahaina, I thought, damn, there's a problem there. But after putting it in the context of some of these other photos, I'm going, ah, okay, let's not jump to conclusions. I need to be a bit more careful about the thinking process of how to nail down what's going on. So yeah, look, um, uh, then we, we set out and, uh, you know, one of the places we started to work, and I wanted to step you through a little bit of the sequence of the way we did this work, is we did some work around the lighthouse that, um, that's pretty cool. We, as we're going along, one of the things we do in the boat is we annotate and label um, things that we find interesting so that we can go back to them at the end of the day because nobody wants to go back through half a million photos when they get home. So you need a method to kind of go, whoa. So 
I can tell you that we noticed some, a lot of fish here and a bunch of fish here and a bunch of fish here, and I can't remember what it was that we put a mark there for, but the point is this allows us to have situational awareness so that we kind of get to the middle of the afternoon and we go, oh, let's go back to that other place over there so we know where to go. We can readjust our sampling design, our sampling strategy. It accelerates this idea of reviewing data after you come out of the field and it allows us to bootstrap the kinds of machine learning that you'll see in a minute. Um, here's some footage that literally comes from the guy. This is what the, the machine saw on uh, part of that coast. It's quite fast. If you're flying the machine and uh, taking care that it doesn't bump into things, it's a, it's a hectic process for your brain. But here you go. Now it's starting to recognize urchins and fish. A whole bunch of Abadef duff, the little black and white ones. The green things are urchins, the red things are fish that aren't otherwise tagged. But this is the beauty of this kind of system is that we can make these estimates uh, in such fine scale and map stuff out. So here we go, in that area, the uh, first thing I'm going to say is this image has been created to show three different types of targets that we examined. Um, the, they weren't obviously one done hard against the coast and another one you know, 300 metres further offshore. Uh, we've just placed them like that so that you can separate them out. So where were the urchins? Well, they're the, in the highest densities in these red areas here, big bunch of urchins around here, smaller little patches of them around, a lot of urchins back here. What about the, uh, well, first off, the, uh, the yellow tangs? Now, man, we, we weren't necessarily expecting to find a whole lot of them. We found thousands of them. Just, uh, you know, and including some schools. David, what was the maximum school size? Oh, I think I've got it somewhere, 30, 30 or 36 or something or other. Um, and the Hawaiian sergeant, uh, it's an Abadef duff, um, interestingly enough, a lot less common uh, and patchy and no immediate, uh, you know, kind of reason for why it occurred in those areas. But the data's there. We can go back and mine it anytime we like. Someone asks a new question, we can go back and mine that data again. So what was the most of the sergeants that we found in any image, it was 30. Um, and the total detections in, this, in any image, now, how many can you count? How many Aberdeaf duff can you count there? And how many urchins can you count? Now, that's done every 70 milliseconds. That, it's, it's five times faster than that. It's, I can't even click my fingers fast enough. How many of the yellow tangs were there? You can see them. Can you count 36? How cool. What about the urchins? Now, you can kind of guess there's a bunch of urchins there, but 22? There you go. So let's now move on to talking about Lahaina. The two really, really key deliverables, and I'm, I'm happy to say we, we totally delivered on both of them, is all the way from uh, Cinder, uh, Cinder Cone through to Black Rock, following the three metre contour, and then again, following the 10 or it's about eight metre contour, um, capturing all of that for future analysis, for interpretation, for a, a archival record, we can go back and ask a whole bunch of questions of later on. Second thing is, the AR have provided um, two areas where they suspect that if material is washed out of a water course uh, and then it drifts with the waves, currents, winds, etc., cetera, um, it may go into this area here and there's another one, you know, a couple of kilometres further north going, going to the north. So part of the notion was that in addition to just these two long transects at three metres and at 10 metres, we would capture vast amounts of the seabed in here so that 
at any time if there's concerns over an impact that starts here and spreads out in a, in a direction, then we can re-interrogate the imagery, choose some sampling sites, go back in, perhaps do it again and map changes that are occurring. Now, I don't put this in here to offend anybody. Understand that Lahaina, I just looked this up myself, 220 years it's been used as a you know, Western style port. Ships coming and going, and I've got to tell you, 220 years ago, I suspect that their thoughts about what they threw overboard and, and all the rest of it were pretty different to what we would do today. We find, uh, you know, there's tire, there's a tire, we found a, a, a boat's ladder, there's a 44 gallon drum. I say this only to point out that when you view what might have gone in there because of fire, and I can, I can guarantee you, none of that is fire related. So when you think about the stuff which might be in the bay because of fires, think about it in the context that like Lahaina is a working port and has been for 220 years. So yeah, there'll be things there, you know, it's good to have a record so that you can assess new stuff and things like that. These are the images that, that made me sit up and take notice. It looks to me like there's white sand that's got black stuff on the top of it. It looks to me like there's some kind of grey algae filament cover, you know, covering some corals there, likewise here. But I have to say, they may be, may, don't jump to conclusions, please, they may be uh, by degree more so than some of the stuff I saw elsewhere. But I can tell you, I, I saw grey sand and uh, combinations of this funny grey white sand and, uh, and lava rock amongst the corals in a number of other places, all the way through, down through Kihei and, and, and the rest of it. So we also saw some cool things, you know, it's like, hey, look at that little pipe fish, isn't he a beauty? Still within the Lahaina area um, and on a sandy bottom that's yeah, it's a little bit of brown sand, but that's just kind of, you, you guys have got sand of all colours here on the island. And plenty of live corals amongst some basalt and some, uh, some lava. We also ran our, our, our um, detections over this. And so we have, you know, urchins around some of these areas. We have yellow tangs throughout the area. Lucky over here, there's plenty off the front of the resort. And make a nice snorkeling area. In fact, I think we owe an apology to a lifeguard. We don't have to go into that. <laughs> so takeaways out of this, uh, and I think the intention is to move to Q and A after this. But, um, and this is the way John expressed it: We're in the calm before the storm. I tell you what, it was it was quite magic to have gone out of our way and John and Amy and, and ourselves, we all kind of pressed the go button even before there were really plans in place. And the reason for that is because we wanted to get this done before the rains. Well, guess what? At the first rain that we felt in the entire trip just started literally as we came past the, the um, uh, Oluwalu area after finishing our last last transect past uh, Lahaina. And I notice as we're driving up from, from where we're staying today, there's a little bit more rain. Uh, all you need is rain happening on that lee side of that mountain and, and starting to come out. Now, I say rain, the other thing is, and I know I've discussed it with John, oceans around the world, there's almost as much fresh water enters them through underground. Uh, sources coming out below the seabed, you know, below the low tide mark. So you've got the possibility of groundwater going out as well as surface water going out. So anyway, um, spatial, so the p impact pathways that are likely to, yeah, if there's any impact, the pathway by which it happens is not necessarily well known. The spatial sense, timing and severity of any potential impacts is difficult to predict. And in any event, it will be so subject to the winds, the tides, 
whether it occurs when the corals are stressed by high water temperatures or not, will, will also affect what might happen. And, and that's a terrible, terrible set of riddles that, we, that you face right now because you actually don't know where to go looking for certain things. And the only answer in that situation is this planning that John's put in place that says, so let's take a snapshot of everything. And then in a few months time, or when, if you begin to see something that, that worries you, you'll be able to go back and check and make a comparison. Or indeed, even now, you have the ability to review that footage and go, ah, maybe we need to go over there and take some sediment samples. And, and that will drive the way you, you know, conduct the next phase of the response. So the story hasn't yet been told. There's now a fantastic archive of pre-rainfall. We got it, John. <laughs> um, ecological conditions. Um, the data can help point you in the direction of further steps in investigating and managing, and we look forward to helping you guys with that. Mahalo. Hello. Okay. So I've been diving here for a long time. I've got a lot of hours in the water and pretty much all around this island, Big Island, Oahu and so on. One of the things I've always noticed is this blank rock on the bottom. A lot of it. You get coral heads here, you get coral there, down in Kanayo, deep water, 60, 70 feet. You still, it's not because of the surf. It's not because of anything I can see. What do you think is causing that? I have a theory it might be a chemical in the lava, but I don't know. It's just things are not starting to grow. Um, I'm not a geomorphologist, but I'll have a punt. Mm. Um, we saw a number of places where the rocks were, I think I might have even used the term basalt in, in my talk, which is actually a, a, an incorrect you know, expression that, because I really don't think that they were basalt as such. Many of your lava rocks, the ones in, you know, the harder ones there, still appear to be somewhat sedimentary. It's a bit weird, I, I didn't really expect that but I could well imagine that the rock is not so hard that it doesn't weather uh, fairly quickly. And the things that corals hate is to settle on a surface, just get going, and then the surface breaks away underneath them and they, and they fall off. So I think there's a bit of instability at the very surface layer of some of those rocks. I don't know. Oh, hang on. Uh, Microphone over here. Thank you, Elliot. Um, I wanted to ask about the resolution of the, I guess, the images or also the AI. Um, is it able to tell between live coral and not, or bleached coral? And also, can it tell if there's algae coverage? Can you do like a percentage of algae coverage as, as a determination of the health of the coral, not just that there's coral there? Um, short answer is yes. Uh, and the long answer is it's very easy to go in in wrong directions with AI and teaching, trying to teach it, you know, uh, to define, to discern things which are in fact hard for a person to discern unless you get right up close. So general rule of thumb is if you can review the footage and see the difference yourself, then you can teach an ML to see that difference as well. Uh, so one of the things we did to try and simplify uh, and, and have a power machine learning model is for some of the stuff on our last project, estimator and the the alternative was it was not live coral we didn't attempt to break that down any further we just said percentage live coral we had 96 percent accuracy uh, now 
One of the things about ML2, which is rather cool, is if I showed a photo of a bit of the coral reef to everybody here and I had you write down in your, in your notes on your phone what percentage cover it was, some of you will estimate high, some of you will estimate low. If I ask you that every 30 seconds for the next two hours, your accuracy is going to change as you yawn and get tired and lose focus and think about what you're cooking for dinner tonight. So the ML can do that 14 times a second without blinking and it never changes its bias. If it's getting, for example, things 80% right, it'll get them 80% right every 70 milliseconds, which at least gives you a metric which is probably better than what many divers will do. Now, as for then subdividing it into particular types of algae, um, bleaching, bleaching is a tricky one because, if, for example, you guys have many, many pale, creamy parietes, corals, which at first glance you kind of go, oh, bleached. And you go, no, pale. It's naturally pale, creamy. So uh, I don't, I'm not aware of anyone in the world solving the problem in ML yet about bleached versus naturally pale versus paling under stress type of corals. We're actually having a crack at it with some, some people ourselves. It's an important distinction, particularly with the world's oceans going a little bit warm. Any other questions? You'll have to fight each other. Oh, okay. Uh, I just wanted to ask about um, the survey you did in the fire zone. I remember you saying everything else was uh, three meters and 10 meters off the shoreline. Just if you could give a little more detail about how thorough it was or what exactly you surveyed in that area that was uh, recommended by um, DAR. Yeah. Uh, so we ran, uh, we on that particular day, we had to do our travel and do the two sites and get back. That was our schedule for the day. So we decided to allocate around about two hours. We, we did a couple of little other things as well, but we allocated about two hours to each of those two sites. In that time, we were able to do something like six, uh, about 10, 10 and a half kilometers worth of, uh, of seabed coverage, up and back, up and back. And we also ran a couple of transects across, uh, as in from the shallow to the deep. Uh, that actually allows us to help tie together any 3D product that comes out of it. Uh, so 10 kilometres uh, uh, is about, uh, about five hectares of seabed captured in, the, in each of those two areas. So it's a, it's and it's quite a, a uh, it's not entirely uniform. It's a little bit uh, irregular, but nevertheless, it spans the entire distance. The samples are independent. A, stati a statistician would say, are the samples independent and all the rest of it? And yeah, yeah. So it's. I think we've captured a really good um, uh, overview of those areas. Certainly enough that if there are changes. The interesting thing about the kind of changes you might find is that they are likely to start from somewhere and progress out. And that being the case, we've got transects going parallel and at long distance further and further away from the potential source so that you might be able to track progress. About five in each of those areas. Sorry, can you, can you, um, it's, we're trying to capture the, uh, the questions as well as the answers on the... Sorry. Yeah, the one that you showed, I think, on the screen was uh, um, like by Mala, and the other one, was it further, it was further south or further north? Uh, sorry, I... You don't remember. I uh, looked at the map and followed the line. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, heck, I can't even pronounce most of your names. <laughs> Yeah, John, you. Thank you. 
Sorry? Wahi Kuli. That, that, yes, yeah, so that's the one I didn't put the photo up. I, I'm sorry, I meant to do that as I was preparing the presentation and I kind of ran out of time, so. Hey, we only got off the water at 11 today. <laughs> We're still doing that presentation, so. Uh, yeah. Um, two questions. One's kind of a geeked out question. How many terabytes of data were collected? Uh, um, I look, I always use the rough rule of thumb of two per day for a machine that's operating for an entire eight hours. Josh tells me that's not really true, but, <laughs> but it's a good number. What, um, there you go, 70 gig an hour and we did 18 hours. Okay. Um, Being the geek, you can work out the math. Great, I'll do the math on that later. Um, the other question is a bit higher level. What do you uh, anticipate or recommend in your experience from this? Um, seems like we're in an urgent moment here where we have all this information. And are there ways to mitigate the carbon that's due to be um, deposited into the ocean? Is there mulching or planting or revegetation? Or what other things do you recommend we look into doing quickly? Um. Let me tell you a tiny bit about my background, because again, I don't want to I don't want to provide answers to something that I don't really know a lot about. So uh, I have no experience with bushfire discharges into the ocean, personally. A lot of experience with oil spill management, ship groundings, nutrient discharges. Conducted one of the largest ever groundwater discharge studies of pollutants, in this case hydrocarbons, including pyrogenic hydrocarbons uh, into marine environments in Australia. Uh, lots and lots of sediment studies, lots of ecological studies. Um, and, and my guess is that someone should review that footage fairly quickly to try and work out whether uh, what the research questions are because there's, there is more work needed to, to do that. So park this over here and say, there probably should be some sediment, underwater sediment sampling uh, to try and confirm the nature of some of that material, uh, whether it's in fact entirely normal or not. Um, it's always better, and you talked about intercepting it and mulching it and stuff like that, it is always better to stop a pollutant from spreading, as in capture it when it's, this big, instead of trying to pick up tiny skerex of it when it gets out into the ocean. And everything in the ocean is harder to do than it is on land. Uh, I've, I've done some, the world's largest ship damage assessment in the Great Barrier Reef. It's a huge uh, impact site. And come up with methods to collect the material underwater and to treat the water that's used in the process of capturing it underwater and it's not an easy job i can i can guarantee you uh, so absolutely anything that that intercepts it and allows people to more readily deal with it would be fantastic but that doesn't all the time work uh, you know and it, it doesn't whether it's circumstances and, and whatever you know it's it's these things are you know accidents because they're not planned <laughs> and and it just you know I all I can really say is manage it at the source as much as possible and and then maintain surveillance and studies to work out what might be happening in the water and uh, and you'll have to make it up as you go along because there's really not a lot of precedent for it and if there is somewhere else it doesn't suit your your hydrodynamics and your you know the water flows and where the coral is and stuff like that about all I can say. Thank you. So uh, one of our Zoom attendees was asking, what is a coral reef affected by fires going to look like in the mapping? Well, the first, the first point I wanted to try and make in my talk was that you actually don't know 
you don't know whether it's going to be, for example, simple ash, which might form a bit of a layer over the corals and things like that. You don't know whether it's going to be uh, chemicals that were uh, released as a result of the fire. And let's not get into nasty chemicals for a minute. Let's just talk about, we know that fires um, are associated with increases in nitrogen and phosphorus, so i.e. nutrients, just come out of the soil. But you know, the soil disturb, the fires disturb them, the soils are uh, more likely to be eroded, things like that. So you can expect a pulse of nutrients. Nutrients aren't good for coral reefs. They're adapted to work in low nutrient environments. I'm going to say this. When we flew in, I saw a couple of big trichodesmium slicks. Now, I don't know what you guys have seen in the news for the last two days. I believe there was some slick on a beach somewhere here. Um, my wife's grandfather told me once that uh, his father had taught him that these things were called whale spawn or what was the other one? Sea sawdust. The point of that story is that a hundred years ago, they had a name for it. A hundred years ago, the old timers saw it, so it's not new. That doesn't mean that it's not exacerbated by the fire. You guys have had some unusual quantities of it. We certainly encountered it several times in the bay here. Uh, John's taken some samples. Um, it, it's exactly trichodesmium. Uh, I, we encounter it all the time in, in Australia. John came across a really cool paper about the history of uh, uh, some uh, Australia-wide distributions of trichodesmium picked up by satellites. Um, certainly, there's a possibility that it'll be nutrients. Then there's a possibility that it could be other chemicals. Uh, there's a possibility it could be chemicals applied during a, a fire response process. There's a possibility that it's chemicals that originated from burned vehicles or buildings. So the reality is you don't know what a coral reef that's affected by fire is going to look like. And that's actually the nice thing about having a snapshot of images that you can go, hang on a minute. Oh, no. Here's an example, an example where I was happy to say I was wrong. One of the images I looked at from the Lahaina area had a whole bunch of that halimeter. I don't know if, is there a local name for that? Uh, some people call it sea cornflakes. Uh, it, it, oatmeal algae, right, okay. So it's an algae. It's green when it's growing. And half of the stuff that I saw in this photo was white as in it dying and lost its tissue. Now, John tells me this is the right season for it, you know, post uh, release of, of uh, spores, etc., to die off here. And lo and behold, off Kihei, where you've got enormous halometa beds, fantastic halometa beds, guess what? Half of it's dying at this time of the year. So I'm going, okay, well, that's not necessarily a sign that there was a problem. But the point is, you've got a data set there. It's very, very big. You can kind of go, all right, well, here's the area where we think we had the effect. Uh, what does it look like here versus over here versus over here? There's all kinds of things you can extract from that imagery. One of the things that, I, that caught my eye is in the seabed up closer to Kanapali, there's areas there where there's thousands of wormholes in the sand. Thousands and thousands. They're a very, very healthy sand bed of, of the critters which live in the sand. And coral reef scientists are guilty of overlooking algae and overlooking the things in the seabed, you know, we all like the corals. Um, but uh, I, you know, there's another potential indicator for you. If there is something uh, settling onto and then ultimately becoming mixed in the sediment, then you could well expect that it would impact the critters which live in the sediment, which, for example, you know, burrow, filter water through and, and dis dispense with the sediment that goes through their fin, you know, not fins, but uh, uh, chelae and stuff like that and through their mouth parts, et cetera, uh, and, uh, and 
if there's something there, you might expect to see a response in the sediment dwelling community, Maya fauna. And, and so maybe that's something to look for as well. I, I saw some places up around the Lahaina uh, uh, seabed where you could see old, but not new, burrows for these critters. Again, a single observation like that, it's not enough. And I didn't have time to do any kind of a systematic search. I didn't, I, you know, if I was investigating it, I'd actually map out the number of those holes all the way along and I wouldn't form an opinion until I'd gone, oh, there's where the problem is and map it to some, set, some change in the sediment. Anyway, John's got his hands full now, sort of, uh, you know, telling the story, doing the science that's necessary to tell the story. And then once the story is known, working out where to target interventions and stuff like that. Uh, Go. Yep, two more questions only. So um, my question uh, and, is. Oh, oh, sorry, you did have your hand up early yeah. on, yes. And after that, <laughs> you? Um, yeah, so my question is, how would somebody or an organization uh, have access to the data and your analysis in the future, say, if you want to do another comparison? Um, the easy question is, take the, question, take the request to John. <laughs> um, uh, look, we, at this point in time, uh, uh, we aren't selling our machines. And there are, there's a couple of reasons for that. They're very, very complicated to use. They're, they're simple, but I tell you what, unless you can program computers like Josh, it's actually a bit hard to keep on top of things, unless you can fly uh, your, your Xbox controller a bit like a ace fighter pilot. It's a, sometimes hard to dodge the corals. Um, I was going to say, although on this particular time, I think, uh, who was it? Josh is the only one. Oh, no. David's the only one who didn't actually have an issue with the machine. <laughs> um, We'd be, we'd be super happy to come back, super happy to do analysis with you guys and stuff like that. Super happy to provide um, John with uh, access to data and things like that. So some of the details to be worked out, but uh, believe me, we're keen to see um, that information used in the best possible way to help resolve for understanding and managing the the process of the response and for educational purposes around the broader community, etc. Oh, yeah, let me, let me deal with that. We would like to actually hold the original data ourselves for a whole bunch of reasons. But one of them is when we came here, the only reason we have models of diadema and fish and things like that is because those models are built around what our system has learned elsewhere in the world. So we come here and we can quickly adapt models and just retrain them a little bit on your stuff to start getting useful results. So we like to build that library of, of a zoo of models. Um, the other thing is, um, I hesitate to put up a map that shows where the yellow tangs are because I believe you can, the, uh, <laughs> You, you know that <laughs> there's obviously an issue. <laughs> um, all right, the final question. Hang on, do it, a uh, microphone. Hi, um, I was just wondering if you guys didn't get to cover any areas due to Coast Guard not letting you there or, yeah. Well, as a uh, captain of the vessel, I'm uh, a little conscious that um, I mightn't want to show some of the maps <laughs> for where we were. But no, look, we, we, we actually had a great run out of the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard were fantastic. Um, uh, they were very inquisitive about what we were doing. Uh, and when they saw that uh, we were dragging this and, and we took the machine out the water showed them had a great old chat about what it was we were doing and uh, and they 
they kind of went, okay, well, don't go too close in around there, but otherwise you're good to go. And we did that on two, two occasions. The only guy I offended was a, a lifeguard up a little bit further up the coast uh, who, who didn't like us within a swimming area. Um, <laughs> granted, there was nobody there at the time, but <laughs> we were operating very close to the coast. And uh, in that particular area, for example, uh, we had the machine off to one side of the boat because that was where the surf was breaking and the boat was about me to you outside of the surf. So it, look, it look, all looks a bit scary to people and sorry, Brandon, I probably didn't need to say that again. But <laughs> <laughs> um, look, no, no, we had no problems whatsoever. They were actually, in fact, yeah, yeah, actually we invited them along. Is there anyone from the Coast Guard here? And And please... Don't feel you have to stick up your hand if. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, look, and here's my take. You don't become a Coast Guard person unless you love the ocean. And people who love the ocean tend to enjoy other people who love the ocean. We love the ocean. They love the ocean. If we have been idiots, then I'm guessing they would say something, but I don't think we're being idiots. Okay, I think that wraps it up. A big hand for Flying Fish. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much for Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, hopefully we'll start getting more into normalcy here and we'll start having more public meetings here, community events. So thank you for being here and everybody have a good night. Aloha.